what does all mean? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? There are very there are many verses in reference to what Jesus did for us that use the word all or something synonymous like every man or the world. And the argument stems from the debate between the free will Freddies and Chosen Charlies about who Christ died for. And in my previous talk on limited verses and limited atonement, I spoke about a list of items where the free will Freddies and the Chosen Charlies make every item the same answer, i.e. Jesus loved every single person and wants every person to be saved and is the saviour of every single person, or it's just the elect, the elect, the elect. And I've argued that I don't understand why the, these all need to be the same. Who is forcing them all to be the same? And uh, I remember a sermon by a guy ripping against Calvinists for not believing that all really means all. Um, but all and its synonyms do have context as to how it applies. For example, if somebody said uh, something really embarrassing happened at school today and everybody saw it. Well, you wouldn't infer from the word everybody that it, it was caught on camera, went viral on the internet and was all over the news and, you know, all over the world. You, you wouldn't even necessarily infer that everybody in the school saw it either. But obviously, it's, you know, perhaps in a classroom, everybody in the classroom saw it. So to extend a bit of grace to both the Free Will Freddies and Chosen Childies, this is a difficult issue, even though all is a simple word in of itself, because some passages don't necessarily make it extremely obvious and some passages seem a little bit contradictory and even within one specific book of the bible even the author himself won't use the specific word all the same way in every instance so allow me to choose the book of romans as an example in chapter 1 verse 7 paul addresses his letter to all that be in rome now that verse makes it very obvious what all means there all that be in rome but then when we carry on reading to verse 18, which says that the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness of men, well, you wouldn't say that the wrath of God is addressed only to all of the Romans or exclusively or specifically. OK, so, so obviously, even within one chapter, the context of what all means has, has changed. Furthermore, Paul just explained that the just shall live by faith. So then you have to add a little clause to the word all in verse 18 interpreting it to say that the wrath of god is revealed against all ungodliness except for those who are justified by faith okay so fast forward to chapter three then paul explains that all are of the sin all are gone out of the way all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god we, we wouldn't assume that all means anything else than absolutely everybody okay whether the christian or non-christian saved or unsaved where where the word all gets more complicated is in chapter 5, particularly in verses 18 to 19, where Paul says, As by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, this gets a bit tricky because we all agree that the condemnation applies to everybody, which is why we need a saviour. Well, if we say that the free gift has come upon all men, why aren't all men justified of life? But if we say that all only refers to the elect, then we have to change the definition of all between the first half and the second half of, of Paul's statement. Okay. But instead, I propose that we could reinterpret all for both sides of that verse according to the following verse, that by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So the point that Romans 5 gets at here is not whether the free gift came upon every single person that ever existed down to the last individual, but rather that it came upon many, irrespective of how many people are justified onto life, because it's not the many that's actually important, it's the one that's important. So just as many, many people were made sinners, because only one person disobeyed, Adam, so were many, many people made righteous because only one person obeyed, Jesus. So there's a lot of passages where if you just lazily quote the verse in ignorance of the passage around it, then you can make it look like it applies to every single individual, but in context it doesn't necessarily. So for example, let's take Second, uh, sorry, Second Timothy uh, 2.4. For God, our Saviour, will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of 
the truth. Is that Second Timothy? I might have, maybe it's First Timothy. I might have made a mistake there, but you, you recognise the verse anyway. Well, what did Paul mean by all men? Well, he opened the chapter, exhorting the reader for prayers and intercessions and supplications to all men. And in verse 2, he clarifies what all men means. For kings, all that being authority, and later in the chapter, he'll talk about the women. So all men here doesn't refer to every single person in existence. It's, it's specifically about men, not really about women or children for that matter. And it's men of any stature of authority. So God will have all types of men to be saved, even if they're kings or soldiers or ministerial leaders. So we should pray and give supplication for all types of men. But it's not even them being saved is not even the main motivation so much as the main motivation is so that we, as the saints, can live a quiet and peaceable life. Okay. Now, all of those aforementioned passages were relatively easy to explain. Some verses are a little tricky. And this is particularly most controversial to the question, who did Jesus die for? Did he specifically say, did he specifically die for every single person or just the elect? But then I think the problem with this question is that people get confused as to what it means to die for somebody or to die for all. Is that the same as saying he suffered for all? Or is it the same as saying he is the propitiation for all? Or is it the same as saying he tasted death for for, for all of you. Are those all the same thing? From some verses in the Bible, we can only infer Christ dying for the saints. So, for example, in Romans 5 8, it says, God commended his love towards us, and it's that word us, and he's, he's writing to the Romans, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I've already mentioned Romans 5 earlier that the context of we and us is, is we who have been justified by faith, who have access to grace. So technically that verse can only be directly applied to us that while we were yet sinners. However, there is the discrepancy that this does not necessarily mean that Christ dying for us is, ex is automatically exclusionary to the unsaved. Uh, but from that verse specifically, we can only ascertain that he died for the saints particularly. Same again in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.10. Now, where it gets a bit complicated is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where it says that he died for all. So in verses 14 to 15, Paul says, For the love of God constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and, and rose again. So this is a bit of a tricky one, because it does say that Christ died for all, but then Chosen Charlie might point you to the context and say that in verse 15 that the purpose of Christ dying for all is that they which live should live unto him which died for them. But then Free Will Freddy could flip that around and say, well, why couldn't Paul just say he died for us? Just change that one little word and it's so much simpler. Or another way of saying you could say like Free Will Freddy could ask Chosen Charlie, what if Paul actually did mean all, everybody, absolutely. How would Paul have to phrase this word, this this verse, in a way which would convince Chosen Charlie that he really did mean everybody? Like, what would Paul have to say to make Chosen Charlie accept that? And I think the problem with these questions is that we get too occupied on trying to figure out who Christ died for, whereas Paul was actually more occupied with the purpose of him dying and what he actually achieved. So when Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 5 that Christ died for all, he's not trying to resolve a Calvinism versus Arminianism debate there. He's not giving a dissertation on whether every man has the free will ability to choose the gospel. That, that's got nothing to do with what he's talking about. Rather, he's explaining a very similar point that he made in Romans 5, that if Christ died for all of us, you and me, then both you and me were all dead, because if we weren't dead, Christ didn't need to die for us, right? And in context, he's talking about the death in the body and the hope of belonging to Christ. And further in that chapter, we read that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. Well, unless you're a universalist, you cannot possibly interpret the word world as meaning every person in existence, because not every enemy of God has been reconciled 
uh, you know, some of them will, many of them will have their trespassers imputed onto them. Otherwise, who's populating hell? Uh, every unsaved person is going to have to have their sins imputed onto them, right? So some of you will ask, well, why say reconciling the world then? Why not say something less confusing? Well, it's only confusing because you're thinking about it in the wrong way. Free Will Freddy thinks that he's saying the world, every single person in existence. Chosen Charlie thinks world, every tribe, tongue and nation. But I think that's a bit of a stretch because it's borrowing a concept from another verse and sticking it in there. Um, what he means is the world, the place where all the spiritually dead sinners are, the place where the enemies of God are, the place where the lost sheep are wandering around, that's the world that is reconciling. That's what it means. So we as the foe, God is reaching down onto earth to save us. And, and, and the foe become we become a friend of God. The foe becomes friend. We are reconciled. So, if you think about it from that aspect, it's not confusing language at all. It's just don't get so fixated on who all is. Just understand the purpose of why God is explaining this. That the enemies of God, all the people that will be saved, God is going to save them. That that's all it is. It, it's not something that's meant to be overly complicated.